A quiet church is a what? Yeah, we ain't dead in here. I mean, so I'm going to give you full permission, throw the disclaimer right up front. Feel free, free to preach with the preacher. Amen. And uh, let's engage together tonight. Amen. Before I dive into the word real quick, um, you know, our media team, they're asking, so what are the announcements for next week and the upcoming season? Next Sunday, it's Mother's Day. And it's like, that is a, that's an important day. Guys, if there was ever a Sunday to be nice to the wife, this is the one, all right? And all the wives say, oh, that's right, preacher, preacher right there. And uh, so Sunday, um, we like doing church in the evening because we get to kind of sleep in for those of us who can. If you got four kids and some of them are young, you don't sleep in any time at all. But, um, but for those of you who can sleep in, that's cool. And uh, Sunday uh, evening when we come back to church here, all the gals, all the, the ladies, all the women of the house uh, are going to be receiving a gift. So whether you're single, whether you're married, indifferent, whether you got kids or not, all the girls, we're going to celebrate the, the ladies of the house, we're going to bless them with a gift. And uh, so that's the Sunday that you absolutely want to come. And uh, if you have a mom that doesn't attend church, bring them to City Life Church. It's a great church. We highly recommend it. <laughs> and, uh, um, and again, we're going to have just a special time. Pastor Elena is going to preach next Sunday, and I'm excited. That girl can preach, so it's going to be a treat. And uh, I just I get to just kind of sit back and relax, and it's going to be awesome. So I'm looking forward to that. And uh, so that's next Sunday. And then... Also, kind of last minute, as I was uh, just praying over the week, uh, I had already sent the media folk um, the announcements that were coming up. And I just felt like the Holy Spirit said, you know what, it's time to, to kind of take this to the next level as far as our pursuit of the Holy Spirit. We've been talking about the irresistible friend, the Holy Spirit, that is. And uh, I just felt, I, I knew the Lord was challenging me to, to pray even more. But I said, as a church, we can't just talk the talk. we got to walk it as well And that we are a praying people. Anything that comes of the Spirit must be birthed through prayer. So none of our worship team, none of our media tech team, no, nobody knew about this. I, I talked to Elaine. I said, babe, I feel like the Holy Spirit is saying, even if we show up with four people to pray, that's still going to be good. So what we did is this Friday, those of you who are available for, for just one hour from 7 to 8, we're going to come and we're going to pray. We're going to just press through and see what the Holy Spirit wants to do in our midst. Amen. I can't wait for the day where we actually have regular prayer meetings like every day in the house of the Lord. Prayer spots, just just lighthouses throughout our communities where people can come and just encounter the Holy Spirit and take a little break from the business of life and come and pray with other believers. I can't wait. There's a day that's coming. We're going to have worship around the clock. It's going to be a powerful thing, and uh, I'm dreaming of those days. But we're, we're taking it from right here. We're starting even this week for those of us who can make it. Some of you guys are getting off work late. I understand. There's no condemnation if you can't come. Amen. No worries. But those of you who can come, we're just going to pray, pray for an hour. And uh, also this week, Keys and Catherine and Sam, Elena, and myself, we went and we, we joined with the city church to pray. The citywide church prayer meeting, it was the National Day of Prayer. And uh, we joined with other folks. And to, to be honest with you, I, I, I don't know pretty much anyone there. There were different styles, different expressions, different ways of praying. I was being stretched. I've been to a lot of prayer meetings. <laughs> I was being stretched. And some of the most powerful prayer times I had was when, when one of the Argentinian pastors came to lead us in prayer. That was powerful. I said, oh, I can relate to that right there. Oh, come on. And we started pressing in. And, ah, it got intense in there. And it's pretty cool. And uh, so nonetheless, though, I feel like it honored the Lord that we would come together and be united. And uh, San Francisco is, is ripe for the picking. God wants to pour out his spirit upon our city. Amen. There have been many faithful men and women of God who've prayed, who've worked, who've sown for years in this community. We're privileged to come towards the latter part of all this work and, and see a mighty outpouring of God's spirit here. I'm, I'm privileged and honored to be a part of this. And, uh, but we want to be counted. Amen. So as a local church, even as, as a young baby church, we want to continue to just pray. And at the beginning of the year, we took uh, 10 days to pray and to fast as a local church. And God continues to give us breakthroughs. And we want to continue to press. I've learned this when it comes to the things of God. When the Holy Spirit says, push, we want to push. We don't want to sit back and pull the lazy boy and just relax and hope that others are pushing. When the Holy Spirit says, push, it's because he's up to something. Amen. I'm believing that for the next few months, God is going to continue to accelerate things in this house. God is continuing to bring people and connecting folks to this house. And uh, you know the saying around here, unless the Lord builds a house, those of us that are, are working, we're just laboring in vain, right? Let's let him build a church and let's not screw it up. That's kind of the plan around here. And God's doing it. He's connecting folks to our church. Pastor Eric Butler was at Shiloh just a, not too long ago, a few weeks back, about a month ago. And we're talking, he says, I sense that there's an acceleration coming. God's going to continue to give you great growth. And he actually threw a number out there. And I said, well, praise the Lord, I'm believing that as long as God's building it, we're going to be okay. I don't want to try to achieve those numbers. As long as God's doing it, I'm in. And he's going to help us. So, but I know this. I know that we need to pray. We need to keep on praying. 
The devil hates the kingdom of God. He wants to resist the purposes of God. So that's a long plug, and uh, I'm not ashamed to plug the prayer meeting. I think it's a good idea because it's a God idea. Amen. Do you have your Bibles tonight? We're going to go all the way back to the Old Testament, to the book of 2 Samuel. And uh, we've been in a series called Irresistible. And uh, at the end of the day, at the very core of anything that's irresistible, it's really all about the Holy Spirit. 2 Samuel, 2 Samuel chapter 9 is where we're at tonight. And uh, we've been repeating something every week. And uh, I'm hoping that this kind of just grabs some of us. Maybe you're kind of new to the whole walk with Jesus thing. A lot of this kind of sounds a little different to you. But uh, my hope is that it goes beyond just head knowledge and it gets to your heart. That you say, you know what, I actually believe this deep down inside. And uh, would you repeat this with me? Would you say, we serve an irresistible God. We preach an irresistible message. And we are an irresistible people. Some of you guys really need to believe that one right there, like we are irresistible. Come on. Let's say it one more time, and uh, let's say like we actually really believe it. Say it with everything in you from the very beginning. You ready for the first one? We. Much better. And we. And we are. Thank you very much. We are. Not because we're that special, but because the Holy Spirit lives inside of us. Therefore, there is an irresistible message that wants to come out. And uh, the, the Bible says that we're called to be salt and light. Wherever we go, we bring the message. Jesus is the message. Amen. And we're just carriers or couriers of that message. Second Samuel tonight is where we're at. And uh, for those of you who are Bible scholars, um, uh, I was talking to our media team tonight. I said, man, I'm bringing a lot of scriptures. I don't want you to be overwhelmed. If you can't keep up with all the scriptures, it's all good. You can check our live stream feed later. I can give you the notes. So don't get caught up with, like, having to write down every word. Amen. If you want that, we can provide that to you later. There are some things that are taught, but a lot of things and most things really are caught. And I, I would hope that what the Holy Spirit has placed in my heart would be imparted into us and that you could catch it more than just information here, that it would be revelation right here in the heart. Amen. Second Samuel chapter 9, I'm reading from the MSG version. So we're sprinkling some MSG in our message tonight. And uh, matter of fact, if you're kind of new to the journey, let me just kind of give you a little backdrop to this story. What was happening was this. God had a chosen people. They're, they were the Israelites, all right? And uh, so the, the Bible goes on to tell, the, tell us that they were slaves in Egypt for many years, but then God sent a servant. His name was Moses to come and lead them out. And he leads them out of Egypt and out of captivity. They go on this crazy missions trip for like 40 years through the wilderness. All the old people had to die off because they were rebellious. Again, giving you the, the abbreviated version. Then the new leader comes up, Joshua, and he takes them into the promised land. And uh, God was their king. God was their God. He was their ruler. They didn't have a king like all the other nations had. And they said, but all the other Joneses have kings. We want to have some kings too. And uh, they got tired of serving the God who had taken them out of Egypt. And they begged for a God and, or excuse me, for a king. And uh, finally God says, really, is that, you don't, know what you're, you don't know what you're asking for because you got the best king right now. And says, but if you really want a man-made version, that's all right. I'll, I'll, I'll hook it up. So God then brings this young man by the name of... Saul to be the first king of Israel. The guy started strong. I mean, the guy started good, just like the warriors the other night. Started strong. <laughs> we like the warriors. Come on, somebody. King Saul actually started okay, but then with time, the fourth quarter came around. The brother got distracted. He became full of himself, and he thought he was the greatest thing since sliced bread. And the spirit of God, the pleasure of God, the presence of God lifted from him, and he began to make one boneheaded move, at, move after the other. And, uh, and he disqualified himself as a king. And then, so God says, I'm going to send another man who is going to take over. And his name is David. Now, the crazy story about this, I mean, this is a phenomenal movie right here. King Saul, he's, he's a big king. I mean, he's the big dog right there. He's the chief of the mountain. He's got a couple boys, and one of them, his name is Jonathan. Jonathan and David become best friends. I mean, they're tight peanut butter and jelly, I mean, they are close like this. They were tight, BFFs right there. And, and Jonathan recognized that there was a strong anointing and a strong call upon David's life, and he didn't care. He didn't feel threatened. They were covenant brothers. It's like they had a soul tie, a good, godly soul tie. But Saul disqualified himself, so therefore God says, I'm going to introduce a new lineage, a new bloodline. And uh, the, the, there was a great battle. The king was killed, and the son, son uh, Jonathan, was also killed. Shortly after, sometime later, God then elevated and exalted David to become the king. 
Okay, are you tracking? So I just gave you a very quick, it's like you turn the DVD and you read the behind the story. That, that's where we're at right now. So, all right. So this is sometime later here after King Saul had died. It says this. Now one day David asked, is there anyone left of Saul's family? If so, I'd like to show him some kindness in honor of Jonathan. And it happened that a servant from Saul's household named Ziba was there. And he called him into David's presence. And the king asked him, are you Ziba? Yes, sir, he replied. And the king asked, is there anyone left from the family of Saul to whom I can show some godly kindness? And Ziba told the king, yes, there is. Uh, there, there's Jonathan's son. He's, he's lame in both feet. Where is he? He's living at a home at, at Maker, son of, uh, uh, the home of Maker, son of Amiel in Lodabar. And King David didn't lose a minute. He sent and got him from the home of Maker, the son of Amiel in Lodabar. And when Mephibosheth, try to say that real fast ten times. If you haven't been baptized in the Holy Spirit yet, practice on this real quick and watch what happens. When Mephibosheth, son of Jonathan, was also the son of Saul, came before David, he bowed deeply, abasing himself, honoring David. And David spoke his name, Mephibosheth. Yes, sir. Don't be frightened, said David. I'd like to do something special for you in memory of your father, Jonathan. To begin with, I'm returning to you all the properties of your grandfather, Saul. Furthermore, from now on, You'll take all your meals at my table, not just in the palace, but you're going to come and you're going to eat at my table. Shuffling and stammering, not looking him in the eye, Mephibosheth said, uh, but who am I that you pay attention to a stray dog like me? And then we skip a few verses because David then instructs uh, Saul's servant Ziba. He says, I want you and all of your household and your servants to take care of this guy for the rest of his life. All the property that belonged to King Saul, I want you to fix it up quick, clean it up, because this guy, he's going to get the hookups. I'm going to take care of this guy, and I'm putting you in charge. You're going to take care of this man. And it takes us to verse 12, and then Mephibosheth, that he ate at David's table, just like one of the royal family. And Mephibosheth also had a small son named Micah. All who were part of Ziba's household were now the servants of Mephibosheth. And Mephibosheth lived in Jerusalem, taking all his meals at the king's table, breakfast, lunch, dinner, and the fourth meal, all four of them or whatever, with David at the king's table. But it says right at the end of verse 13, he was lame in both of his feet. And it's interesting how God actually points these things out through the scriptures. Let me give you kind of a couple little thoughts here. As far as ancient tradition goes, whenever a king conquered another king, what would happen was they would not only kill the king, but eliminate and exterminate the entire family, the bloodline, so that there would be no revolution and the next prince or whoever trying to overthrow the new king. It happens that David wasn't the one who killed Saul. He actually loved and honored the family of Saul. He had opportunities to kill Saul before. And when it comes to man's agendas, oftentimes we want to accelerate the game and we want to change things and we want to do things our own way. David says, I can't touch the anointed one of the Lord. I can't, I can't touch the holy one. I can't touch him. Though he had opportunities to kind of like speed up the process because God had called him to be a king, he had been anointed, he had been set apart, he refused to do things his own way. Remember Abraham, our brother Abe from a few weeks ago? He had a promise that God would give him a, not only a son, but he would be a father of multitudes. And it's like, man, come on, God, hurry up with your promises. Where is it? And pretty soon they kind of came up with this idea like, you know what? He and his uh, wife said, maybe you should have a son with one of the other gals. And, uh, and then, therefore, God can fulfill his prophetic word over you. And that was just trouble right there. Pretty soon, Ishmael came around. And whenever we create things out of our own doing and it's not birth of the Holy Spirit, it just means trouble later on. Am I preaching to somebody here tonight? It just means trouble. Trust me, I've been there. Learn from this knucklehead right here of when it is like, oh, you know what? I believe that God said this, so let's just do this and try to create it out of nothing and out of God's timing. It just brings frustration, disappointments. It doesn't last. Come on, somebody. And uh, not only that, but um, so David, e even, even if the king's family line had been preserved, even if someone was just very innocent, the king's like, you know what? I'm feeling good today and for the rest of my life, I'm not going to kill this per poor individual but they can't live in the same city. I don't even want them near, let alone the palace, because we're royalty and they've disqualified themselves. And then to make matters worse, in those days, tradition was if you were handicapped in any way, you couldn't come to the palace. You couldn't come to the king's presence because you were less of a, ci a citizen because of your infirmity or condition. David was a man with, with the heart after God. He loved God, and he, 
He looked beyond the law. He looked beyond the natural things, and he had compassion for God and for people. He says, I love my boy Jonathan, my friend, and he's, he's long gone now, but I love him so much. Is there anyone else left from his family that I can show some love because I miss my friend? And it was kind of risky, but then the word got out, and finally, as we heard the story right here, call the man. Who is he? And the guy says, warning, though, King, he's, he's lame in both of his feet. King said, that's all right. So the guy comes, and it's a beautiful story of redemption. It's a beautiful story of how we're like Mephibosheth. We, we were not worthy. We were the enemies of God, and God comes after us and says, you know what? I'm still preparing a place for you in my palace and in my presence. And not only that, scoot over. I got a place of honor for you at my table. You're not going to eat in the back room, but you're going to come, and you're going to dine with me breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and our four meals. I want you to be a part of my family. That's the beautiful story that we're talking about here tonight, tonight's message. If you're taking notes, it's um, the irresistible favor. We're talking about favor tonight. My goal tonight is to answer four questions when we speak about favor. What is favor? Number one. Number two, why do we need it? Number three, who gets to have it? And then number four, how do we grow in favor? Can I pray real quick and invite the Holy Spirit to help us tonight? Amen. Jesus, we love you, Lord. We thank you so much for your goodness. We thank you for your grace. Holy Spirit, I thank you for our family, our church family. I thank you for what you're doing here. You're knitting hearts. You're bringing us together. Lord, from all kinds of different backgrounds, you're doing something that is supernatural. God, we could not have scripted this in our own minds, but God, you're doing it, and we're standing in awe of you. God, thank you so much. Thank you for your church. Lord, I thank you for this time even tonight. Folks who pressed through, through difficult traffic conditions and weather, they came to the house of the Lord. Lord, I pray that tonight there would be a fresh impartation of your spirit into our lives, that you would quicken great faith within us. Holy Spirit, I, I welcome you, I honor you, and I ask that you'd help me to speak those things that you placed in my heart for this time tonight in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Hey, um, it was about 10, 12 years ago, I was going through a season and living the dream, being a youth pastor, hanging out with kids, doing all-night parties and traveling on mission trips and going to camps and getting paid to do all of that. It was awesome. And uh, people said, man, I, are you crazy? I said, no, I'm just in love with, with junior hires, high schoolers, college, university age students, and we're living the dream. And my wife and I, we were just having a blast together. And uh, we weren't getting paid a huge amount of money, but who cares, man? We were living the dream. And, uh, man, we had, we had great times, great memories. And, uh, uh, and then our cars started falling apart, and I used to drive like this, this European car. I had an import. Um, it looked like an egg. It was a sob story. I mean, a sob, S-A-A-B. And uh, it was a blessing, though, for a while. And then that thing started falling apart. And when it comes to European cars, they start falling apart. It gets m expensive. And uh, so, man, that thing was falling apart. I said, ah, that's all right. We're just going to keep on driving this thing. Literally drove it for I don't know how many years, 10 years plus. Drove it to the ground. It literally, my, you know, my, my oldest daughter was in the car. That thing blew up. We got out and got another car. That's literally how it happened. Um, but nonetheless, I was going through a season where all of a sudden the enemy started kind of wearing me down. And I was getting a little tired. And I'm like, God, I'm, I'm kind of tired of just kind of just getting through. And I, all these promises that you've spoken over my family, myself, my life. It's like, God, how come everyone else gets to have all the fun toys? And I, threw, I began to throw myself a little pity party. Don't raise your hand, but I think most of us at some point have had some of those parties before kind of feeling sorry for ourselves just a little bit. And, and I said, God, you promised me that you would be with me, that your favor would be upon my life, but I'm driving a sob, Lord, and what's going on? And I felt like the Lord said, sell your house in San Ramon and move into Concord. And I, I stepped out in faith. We believed it was God, and we sold the house. And then that's when the market took off. Right after we sold it was when the real estate market went off the charts. Within three months, we couldn't even qualify to buy back whatever we had sold. So we're renting and we're frustrated and we're living in a tiny little apartment. But we love each other and that was, that, that, that's what really counted the most, amen. And, uh, but yet I, I found myself in one of those seasons where it's like, God, I, I'm holding you at your own word. You promised that you would bless me. Lord, you promised that your favor would be upon me. I don't feel like a first-class citizen. The Holy Spirit said, oh, really? I'm going to do something. I, I'm, I don't have to do this. But, John, John I'm going to do something. I'm going I'm to surprise you because the way I look at you, as I don't see you, I see Jesus, and he's always first class. But just so you get a little glimpse, I'm, I'm going to show you a few little things. And for the next 12 months, I kid you not, my wife is my witness. Every time I flew, something crazy would happen. I'd get bummed too. First class. I'm saying, man, I'm living large. This is amazing. 
We go on mission trips. I don't know if there's anyone here that went to like Romania with us. We get on the plane, they bump my wife and I to first class. And I feel like, David, no, I'm not worthy of this offering. Someone else take the front seat. The team says, Pastor, please take it. Then we'll rotate later on. And <laughs> Everywhere we're going, it's like they keep upgrading. And then you know, after a few months, it's like I almost kind of like assume like I'm getting ready to check in. I'm like, um, they're, they're boring now, folks. Um, any minute now? And the lady says, sir, can I help you? I was just kind of waiting for my upgrade. <laughs> oh, were you supposed to get one? Yeah. <laughs> for real. And my conviction was this. The Bible says, you have not because you asked not. She said, you were supposed to get a, an upgrade. I said, I was. And uh, sir, let me help you. We're running late. Let me go ahead and just upgrade you right now. Let me override or whatever. And I kid you not, time and time again, right? I started saving the stubs. Seat 1A. First class seat, 1A. I mean, right up front, they bring you orange juice and like a glass, not a little paper or a little plastic cup, you know. Back in those days, you could actually use silverware and stuff. It's like, man. And it's like, and it was happening. And then, and it was going, and I was living large. It's like, man, I want to fly all over the world. This is awesome. And then all of a sudden, it's kind of like, okay, season over. Wake up. <laughs> I go to check in again. It's like, come on, what's going on? And then I couldn't catch a break. I tried, mileage points, boy, it wouldn't work. And the Holy Spirit says, first class is much more than an experience on a plane. My favor is upon you. Everywhere you go, you're already first class because my son is first class. And you've made room for him. Therefore, I'm going to make a way for you. What you thought was supernatural in your own eyes, you haven't seen nothing yet, son. And all of a sudden, the thing began to just register. And it's, it's okay to fly first class, too. I mean, if the Lord wants to bless us with that, praise the Lord for that. But I came to the realization, you know what, favor, the favor of God. And that's what became a life message for me, the favor of God. Everywhere we go, there's preferential treatment. And actually, not because we're special, but because of the Holy Spirit that's in us. If I pulled up to the mall, it's like, Lord, I'm believing for a parking spot. I'm, I'm going to actually drive all the way to the last row of cars. And there's going to be, and sure enough, man, I'd be driving. It's the sob or whatever, but I'd be driving all of a sudden right there and there. So I'll pull out. That's my spot right there. It had my name on it, invisible, but it, it was there. And I began to live with the conviction of the favor of God is upon me. And when it comes to the favor of God, it's unmerited. It's undeserved. You don't earn it. But by virtue of you being the son or a daughter of God, there's favor upon us. <laughs> and I could talk more about some of my own stories, but let me kind of come back and show you a couple more thoughts here. I'm talking about David Mephibosheth. He wasn't deserving of this. Actually, in the natural, he, had, he was a prime candidate to be executed. He wanted to be in hiding. He didn't want to come out this way. But God had something special for him. I picked up the word favor and the definition. I'll just give you a couple little thoughts. What does favor mean? To favor means to give special regard to or towards someone. To treat with goodwill. To show exceptional kindness towards someone. Sometimes it actually means to show extra kindness in comparison to the treatment of others. That is preferential treatment. What? Can God extend preferential treatment towards some? Some folks can get a little uncomfortable right here. Check this out. Your picture, it, that picture is on God's refrigerator. He loves you that much. You are the apple of his eye. You are God's favorite. So in some ways, yeah, there is preferential treatment. Esther, for example, in Esther chapter 2, verse 17, it talks about all these virgins, all these gals that were being prepared for the king. And yet something was different about her. He chose her. She had the preferential treatment. They had all equal opportunities, but there was something special about her where God set her apart because he knew that she had been separated for such a time as this to be one who would use, who God would use to, to spare the people of God. God bestowed upon her, shared with her preferential treatment. But favor is not always used in a comparative way, by the way, towards folks. It sometimes simply means that, that the one favored has shown kindness and treated with generosity and goodwill far beyond what normally would likely happen or be expected. That, that's, that's for us right here. We don't deserve it. We shouldn't even expect it. But God goes out of his way to just bless us. And favor is upon the people of God. Now, we could compare stories and we could share stories. But then we also have tragic stories of loss and devastation. It's like, man, if I'm favored of God, oh, my goodness, I... I can't even imagine what it would be to be someone who's like distant from God. I mean, I've, I've experienced tough times. 
why is it that this favorite thing hasn't found me? We'll talk a little bit about that tonight as well. As well. God, by the way, he never shows favoritism. You all and we all and myself, all of us, we're God's favorite. He doesn't play favorites in that sense, but he favors everyone. Are you with me so far? Favor in the Bible, I looked it up and did some studying on this. And if you look up the word favor in the Bible, it's actually found in seven words in the Hebrew. That's the Old Testament. And it basically means to be gracious, to show delight, pleasure, acceptance, goodwill. In the New Testament, the word, it, there's, there's three words that are connected there in the Greek. And it basically has to do with the word grace, favor, or gift. Huh. It's the word charis, where we get the word charisma. Oh, that's a charismatic person right there. It's a person who is favored of God. Again, grace, favor, or gift. Re remember this one for later on. Why do we need then? I'm going to start answering some questions. Why is it that we need favor? Does anyone want favor? If you could have the favor of God, how many would sign up for that? So you know what? I, sure, I like some of that. Mm-hmm. Yep, yep. Some of you aren't raising your hand. <laughs> it's your loss. I mean, <laughs> I want to encourage you. Favor, we all, we all want it. <laughs> now, if you're like me, if you ever go to an event and they have a drawing, I'm the one that's never picked. People go to these different events like number 437741. Yay! And someone walks up and they win something. I'm the guy who never won anything like that. Maybe you can relate to my story. Amen? Every event, function, church, family, it's like the family reunion or whatever. It's like people, all, and you're the one that they forgot to bring the gift to. It's the white elephant exchange. And you, I, I could relate to that one. Some of you guys are just going back right now. Oh, no. Inner healing again, Lord. But if we had the option to receive favor, I think we'd all sign up for that. Lord, I, I love to be upgraded. I love to have a, a favor touch from you on my life. I like to have the Midas touch that whatever I touch turns to gold on, on my behalf. Am I preaching to somebody here? <laughs> favor, what is favor and why do we need it? Why do we need it? I'm going to give you a few thoughts of why we should want favor and why we need it in our lives. Number one, when it comes to favor, the favor of God, it opens doors. When the favor of God is upon you, it actually opens doors for you. By the way, the favor of God also closes doors for folks. Some of us, we complain, I don't get any open doors. No, because of the favor of God and the mercy of God, he's kept those doors closed so that you wouldn't walk into something that wasn't of his will. The favor of God in Genesis 39, 20 through 21, it says, and, and Joseph's master, he took him and he put him into the prison, a place where the king's prisons were bound. And he was there in prison, but the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. Oh, that's awesome. Talk about cell ministry. This guy was in prison, amen. And, but the favor of God was with him, and he found favor with the guy who was in charge of the jail. Later, if you study out the story, the, the cupbearer, the baker come and whatnot, Joseph was respected. There's the favor of God. It was a supernatural thing that rested upon his life, and he caught the eye of the leader of that place. Another version, it says, and the Lord made Joseph a favorite with the prison uh, warden. He, he became the uh, favorite. Out of all those that were incarcerated, he was the favorite. Instead of being picked on, the guy had compassion on him. It opens doors for people. I was hanging out recently with a friend. I won't even mention the name over uh, the airwaves right here just because of what the Lord's been doing. But he, uh, he had actually gone to Russia several times to minister and prophesy and do different things. And... Uh, he made it on the blacklist of the KGB. He was not allowed to come back to Russia. He got kicked out. He couldn't come back in. And yet, he's known for many years that he's called to go and minister to Russia. He's got many folks who look up to him as a spiritual father. It's like, how is this going to happen? So things began to change, and through prayer, he continued to, to go through the process and stuff. And, well, finally, just about a month or two ago, he and I, we went to the Russian consulate here in the city. And, uh, man, all kinds of paperwork and stuff and hoops to jump through. And with great grace, I remember sitting there. And listening to these folks just getting irritated and loud and start yelling at the folks that were working. And there was a cool favor of God that was resting upon my friend. As I sat there, we both, we prayed. Before we got there, he, pray, he prayed all night. We were there, and there's just favor upon us. We sat there. There were folks that were nervous and agitated, but there was, there was just a peace upon us. Dealing with the folks there, all of a sudden, it's like, okay, yeah, you still need this. We went back and called Russia, got some more information, filled out the application a little differently. Brought, brought the paperwork through again, and he texted me not too long ago here, like a week or two ago, saying, praise the Lord, I got my three-year visa, uh, multiple entries. I can go in and out as many times as I want for the next three years. I said, best favor. He's been blacklisted, and yet somehow God overturned something, and with the same name, he's going back. Oh, come on. Come on. 
That's favor. God opens doors. I don't know about you, but I like favor. There are certain things that money can't buy. But for everything else, there's visa. No, just kidding. But for everything else, there's the favor of God. There are certain things that if you could buy your way out of, I mean, this guy, if he could buy his visa, he would have done it years ago. But he had to pray it through. The favor of God had to open it up. And now he's got something even better than he had envisioned. A three-year multiple entry kind of visa. Favor. It opens doors. Another word that I like to use for opening doors is this. God gives you access. We got favor. Recently we had a, a worship team come from out of town and we're up the street at this venue. And uh, we, we knew a friend that, that was part of this traveling ministry. And he called us up and says, hey, I've got, uh, I've got some, some passes. Do you guys want to come to this concert? I said, sure, free 99. That's awesome. Let's go. And um, so we go. And a couple of us that he knew, he says, hey, uh, these passes will pretty much get you anywhere. You want to go to the green room, meet the band? Right here. Bam, just put this on. And everywhere we went with this little pass, we had access. We had open doors. Favor. We wanted some food. That spread looked pretty good, didn't it, Riley? I mean, we went back there. Riley and I met some of the band members. I mean, I was like, wow, this is awesome. But I felt guilty. My wife was still, my, <laughs> my friends were still, so we didn't do that. But uh, favor, it just, it could, we could we'd go anywhere. The favor of God upon people's lives, it opens doors. It opens doors. Opportunities come our way. And you don't even have to keep finding the opportunities that just find you. And the favor of God causes there to be promotion. You didn't even sign up for that promotion. They come and find you and say, hey, do you want to maybe stop being a, a, an employee in this, uh, this branch and maybe this other opportunity? Really? Better pay, better hours? Sure. Come on, somebody. That's favor right there, opening doors. Now, don't get quiet with the preacher here tonight. Either this is so good and deep and folks are just, or people are taking a nap. Let's, let's not do that. Number two, here's another thought. The favor of God. Why do we need it? Number two, because it brings a good rapport. Respect and trust. Man, Daniel chapter 1, verse 8 and 9. He says, but Daniel, he purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with a portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore, he requested of the prince of the eunuchs, that he might not defile himself. And now God, watch this. Now God had brought Daniel into favor and tender love with the prince of the eunuchs. Meaning the manager, the guy in charge of, of this internship program, it says that God gave Daniel favor with this guy. Daniel didn't have to go butter it up. And he just found God placed a touch of favor upon his life. And the guy had compassion for him. And if you keep on studying the story of, of Daniel, what he did, he says, I don't want to eat the food at the king. Let me go on this. I'm going to prove to you that my, my diet is better than what you're offering those guys. And you can read the story on your own time. That's the Old Testament. That's before they had Shuhasko in Brazilian state. Come on, somebody. <laughs> but the favor of God, good rapport, respect and trust. The guy that was in charge of this intern program, he put his neck on the line. He's like, dude, if after this season, if you show up and you boys show up and you look less prepared than everyone else, it's my job and it's my neck that's on the line for you. But nonetheless, Daniel, you've, I like you, man. So I'm going to give you this opportunity for the next 10 days. Do this and let's see if you're really right. And uh, so good rapport. The next thought here, why do we need favor? Because favor is better than riches. Proverbs 22 verse 1, it says that a good name is to be chosen rather than, than great riches. Loving favor rather than silver or gold. Having a good name, having, having a good reputation is actually better than having a lot of money in the bank. There are some folks who have a lot of money in the bank, but they, their, their name, their reputation, it's tarnished. Maybe they had to cheat their way into the system in order to arrive where they're at. Well, I, I'd, rather, I'd rather go to sleep with, with, with a clear conscience. The Bible, as a matter of fact, says this, that, that the blessings of the Lord, they make a person prosperous or rich, and he adds no sorrow to it. You know what that means? That God blesses people, and when he chooses to bless them, they can go to sleep at night with a clear conscience. No, you know what? I've been favored of God. I've been blessed of God. I don't have to worry. The IRS, the employer, the neighbor, the whoever, they don't, they're not coming after me because why? I've been blessed of God. The blessings of the Lord, they prosper people. They, they make one rich with no strings attached. Another reason why we need favor, because it causes us to prosper. Prosperity is much more than just finances, by the way. Prosperity of relationships. There are people that are, are filthy rich with money, but they have no friends. It's sad. It's tragic. Prosperity of health and hobbies. Now, we live in the Bay Area. Come on, somebody. I mean, we'll excuse the Raiders. God bless them. But we got the Niners. We got the Giants. We got the Golden State Warriors. We got the Sharks. All my Canadian friends, God bless you. But we're up 2-0, going on 3 tonight. Uh, we are prosperous. Come on, somebody. We can rejoice and we can have a good time. And 
prosperity of God is much more than just sport or sporting events, but you understand what I'm talking about. Psalms chapter, chapter 1, a few verses that I love. Psalms 1, verses 1 through 3. He says this, that, Blessed is the man that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight, or her delight, is in the law of the Lord, and in his law... He, uh, in, and in his law does he meditate day and night, and he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in season. His leaves shall uh, not wither, and whatsoever he does, he will prosper. Imagine this. Everything that you try, it actually works. <laughs> I was hanging out with Denilson, and he was showing me some pictures of this motorcycle that he's been working on. And I just started thinking to myself, I go, dude, I wouldn't even know where to start. It's like he found this beat-up old bike. And it just became a hobby. I'm going to take this thing apart. And he began to take everything apart. And then he began to find parts and pieces. And he showed me the before and then the after. And I'm like, wow, that is really cool. And, but I'm, I'm, I'm complimenting him. But I'm thinking, I, I wouldn't even know what goes where. I don't even know, barely how to sit on one of those. I kind of do. But um, mechanically, the brother's challenged. You know what I'm saying? And there are people that whatever they try, it's like, I'll just figure this thing out. They start working on something. Bam, they fix it. They just have the touch. That's not me. That's just not me. Back in the day, when it came to computer stuff, folks would come to me and say, hey, can you help me out with this? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Nowadays, it's like, i got to find my 11-year-old girl to help me find this stuff and figure it out. But some folks, anything that they touch, it's like they just prosper. They're just good at everything. Have you met someone like that? Life isn't fair. <laughs> some people are favored, though. They prosper in everything. Have you ever met a golden child before? It's like everything they try. They sign up for this one class. There's 300 people like signing up, and they're the ones chosen. The golden child. Maybe that's one of your siblings, you know. And <laughs> when it comes to the favor of God, we need favor because that's what causes us to prosper. Amen? Sam thought that he was favor to God, that God allowed him to marry. So, no, that's not favor, bro. That's mercy right there. <laughs> that's mercy. He allowed you to marry out of... Another league, man, I mean, but praise God. <laughs> Psalm 90, verse, that's for you. Psalm 90, verse 17, speaking of, you know, prospering, favor that causes us to prosper, says, May the favor of the Lord our God rest on us. Establish the work of our hands for us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. Now, what does that mean? Another version, the NLT version, and it explains it a little bit better, says, And may the Lord our God show us his approval and make our efforts successful. Yes, making our efforts successful. Wouldn't you like to be successful in what you're doing? Speaking of our calling, our hands, our, our hands are a picture of what we're called to do, not of who we're called to be, but the things that we're called to do. Wouldn't it be awesome to just have blessings of God all the time? Every business meeting you walk in, you got the folks there, the CEO, all these department heads, they're there, they're looking, how are we going to get ourselves out of this trouble? And ah, favor comes upon your life. You get this brilliant idea, you step out in faith, you say something, they all stand at you going, Brilliant. The CEO stands up and says, that's what we're going to do. That's favor right there. That's favor. In an uncertain day in the market going crazy all around us, all of a sudden God gives folks, businessmen and women of God, the inside scoop. Whatever they touch, all of a sudden that project takes off. That's, that's favor. And then you're marked. There's something unique about that person. By the way, that's your ticket for preaching. They don't need the four spiritual laws. In that meeting, they don't need you to say, hey, if you were to die tonight, would you go to heaven or hell? They don't need you to preach like that. They look at your product. They look at what you do, and they recognize there's something special about you. Now you've earned their trust. And in the opportune time, the employer calls you to the water cooler. You're hanging out. You're talking. That's when you kind of start being real and answer questions as they ask. So what are you up to? Where do you go to church? What do you do Sunday nights? Well, I just drum at a church. They all of a sudden want to hang out with you. Why? Because they see some favor on your life. They don't know that it's favor, but it's a, it's a God touch, and he causes you to prosper. Am I preaching to somebody here tonight? You're, 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 you're vacuuming the house. You're cleaning the carpets, tone, and they're asking you questions. Why is it? Yes, you're a great worker, and they notice that you work out. Praise the Lord. But there's something unique about you. They look at your product and say, man, this is a hardworking guy, and he's happy. You're prospering. The favor of God that's upon your life. Whatever you touch, you succeed. That's what Psalms 90, verse 17 says. Why do we need favor? Here's another one. Because favor brings protection. We're hanging out with Rudy at the park at a little birthday party uh, yesterday afternoon. Keys and I were jumping, potato sack race. And I said, as long as I don't finish last, I'm happy. I wasn't even, I wasn't even trying to win, to be honest with you. I think I could have. But I, 
I just, my goal was just whatever I do, I just don't want to look like a fool and fall. So I'm just going to keep staying right up. And as soon as the dude would start passing me, I'd bump him with my hip and <laughs> keep going. And I didn't finish last. I was successful. I was happy. But hanging out with Rudy from United Plays right here on, on Howard Street. We're hanging out, just talking a little bit. And he was talking about how he goes, bro, did you hear the shoot about the shooting not, not so long ago? They tried to kill me, man. Bullets were flying everywhere and not one hit me. And right then it's like I was reminded, yeah, because your verse is Psalms 512. And he's like, huh? He's looking at me in a pensive way. I said, Psalms 512. I quoted, he says, oh, and it just, it hit him in his heart. He's like, that is my verse. Can you text that to me? It's Psalms 512. The Lord blesses the righteous one and he covers them with the shield of favor. Oh, that, that right there, that, that, that's, that's, that's the money ticket right there. The Lord blesses the righteous one and he covers them with a shield of favor. Everywhere you go, favor. Parking at Target, at the mall, it's full. Favor comes. Make a way. I'm coming through with favor. Lord, here comes that shield. The shield makes a way. And in this case, it's protective. It's a protection. For Rudy, I said, bro, that's because there's a shield of favor around you. God is sparing you. Why? Because God's going to continue to use you. Protection, the favor of the Lord. Oh, thank you, thank you. Another reason why we want favor, why, why we need it, because it gives us the upper hand. <laughs> now, the Lord's wired me a certain way. I know this, this is going to sound strange, and some of my friends from our early childhood, they're going to say, oh, that's how you used to do it. But when we would play games, I, it actually, it was fun to, to win, but I would always find ways. I, I, my mind was constantly thinking, how could I out-scheme my, my opponents? And I'd find ways to play and beat them, but not, not the fair way. I, I, I'd find the upper hand, and I'd learn. And I was intrigued with learning how to cheat in poker or other games or Uno or whatever the card might be, you know. And, they, 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 you know, so I'd, I'd do stuff like I'd slide the card over a cup of black coffee very slowly. And I would see the reflection. Like, oh, I don't want that card. And I'd wait for the ace of diamonds. There it is. I'll keep this one. It's like I was always looking for the upper hand, the edge, the inside scoop, and it was just, I couldn't help but want that. And that's the man-made drive, by the way, within all of us. And God says, in my kingdom, you can try that, but you're going to fail. You're going to come up with, with a bunch of Ishmaels. And the Lord has continued, and I'm still having to go through that school. Us Brazilians, our Brazilian culture, man, it's kind of like, if there's an opportunity available, you seize it, you take it. I mean, you'd be a fool not to take this opportunity. But not in everything is that a godly thing to do. True? My Brazilian friends know what I'm talking about. And it's like the Lord had to like help me. It's like, you know what? I got I to gotta be dependent upon the Holy Spirit. I can't do things out of my own abilities. But when the favor comes upon us, I got the favor. It's like all of a sudden you've got the upper hand. You've got the inside scoop. It ain't fair. But you might as well be the candidate that has it. You might as well be the one with the favor of God. And when it's coming from God, it works. I could keep on preaching on that one for a while here. We need it because we need the upper hand. It's a cutthroat society in the workplace, in the business, at school. It, it's cutthroat. You need, not because you're trying to, like, outdo somebody for the sake of defeating them, but you need the favor of God to cause you to prosper. You understand what I'm talking about, motivation here? By the way, when it comes to the favor of God, it's for a lifetime. Psalms, uh, Psalms 30, verse 5, it says, For his anger is but for a moment, but his favor is for life. Weeping may endure for a night, but his joy comes in the morning. God's goodness and his favor. Listen to this. There's no expiration day when it comes to that. There's no shelf life. When it comes to the favor of God, there's no shelf life. It never expires. Does anybody want some of the favor of God? Oh, come on. So let's talk about a couple more things. Then who gets to have this favor? Is it just for the special people that, that like, helped the little old lady cross the street last week? I mean, who gets the favor of God? These are some clues that I've grabbed from Proverbs. Just a few verses right here. There's a bonus verse for a couple of you that will bless you. Proverbs chapter 8, verse 35, it says, But for, for whoever finds me, that is wisdom. I like to say the spirit of wisdom is the Holy Spirit, by the way. Whoever finds me finds life and obtains favor from the Lord. That's a great clue. Another one, Proverbs 12, 2. A good man obtains favor from the Lord, but a man of wicked intentions he will condemn. Uh, Proverbs 13, verse 15. Good understanding gains favor, but the way of the unfaithful is hard. You're faithful, you're diligent. God honors that. Uh, Proverbs 14, verse 9, it says, Fools mock at sin, but among the upright there is favor. Favor. And then here's the bonus one right here. He who finds a wife finds a good thing. 
And we could just stop right there, and that's just, that's glorious. But then the verse goes on and says, and obtains favor from the Lord. Now, if you found a good wife, that means that you had favor. God gave you favor to find a good wife. And this, this is a sword that could cut both ways. <laughs> if you actually read it and you think about it, he who finds a wife needs favor. I mean, he who finds a wife finds a good thing. And I'll move on quickly before we get ourselves in trouble. But it's a good thing. Come on, somebody. <laughs> and there's these clues in Proverbs. But a couple more thoughts here. we got to understand this. Favor is designed, purpose, and available for all who are followers of Christ Jesus. It's available for all of us. You didn't have to go to Bible college or seminary. You didn't have to go through a membership plan in order to obtain favor from God. At the point that you accept Jesus into your life, the Holy Spirit comes and lives inside of you. All of a sudden, you qualify for favor. You qualify. It doesn't matter if you made mistakes last week or even this afternoon. You qualify for favor. It doesn't matter if you've been running a streak of holiness for a long time or if you just started yesterday, you still qualify for favor. We're all great candidates for that. Praise the Lord for that. Luke 4, 18, it says that the Spirit of the Lord, watch this. Jesus is talking here. He's, he's fulfilling and he's bringing fulfillment to a prophecy that had been, had been spoken many years before. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. He opened a portal of favor for all of those who would follow him and obey him. Jesus says, there are a few that were favored in times past, but I'm introducing a new dimension. I'm introducing a new era, an era of grace, an era of favor. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, and I'm proclaiming favor over you. And it's forward. It's present and future. Favor finds us. Am I preaching to somebody here? This gets a little deeper here. I'm going I'm to keep plowing just a little bit. Jesus, he's already proclaimed favor over your life. Even before you ask for it, he's already declared it over you. Even before you signed up for that application or you filled out that application for that job or for that house or for that, the favor of God was already proclaimed over you. Favor is going to find you. You were blessed before you even did anything. Before you believed or behaved, you were already blessed. Oh, come on. The favor of God. Jesus, and watch this. When it comes to favor, you don't find favor. You don't go after favor. Favor actually comes and finds you. Laser, laser radar just comes finds you, says, I'm bringing favor to you. And he sends it your way. Favor finds you. 2 Corinthians 6, verse 2 says, For he says, In the time of my favor I heard you, and in the day of salvation I helped you. I tell you, now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. And then I like this next one here. Like David prepared a place at the table for Mephibosheth. God's prepared not only a place at the table, but he actually prepares a table for you. It's amazing. That's favor. And probably one of the most famous psalms in, in all the world, funerals and all these different places, even, the, even Hollywood and folks who don't go to church, who don't believe in Jesus, they can quote this chapter. It says this, Psalms 23, NLT version, the Lord is my shepherd. I have all that I need. Do you really? He lets me rest in green meadows, and he leads me beside peaceful streams, and he renews my strength. He guides me along the right paths, bringing honor to his name. Even when I walk through the darkest of valleys, I will not be afraid. For you are close beside me. Your rod and your staff, they protect and comfort me. You prepare a feast for me. Another version says, you prepare a banqueting table or a table for me in the presence of my enemies. In your face is basically our confession. As the enemy, as hell is opposing you, God prepares not only a place at the table, he prepares a table for you where you can actually chill, relax in the midst of confusion and chaos and tur turmoil and torment. God actually says, you know what, I got a place that you can come and chill and nothing can touch you. Nothing can separate you from my love. Nothing can take the favor off of your life because I've promised it over you and I'm going to keep it. Oh, right there, that right there just deserves a praise offering right there. God prepares a place for you. Regardless if the carpet at the new house is going good or not, there is favor on you. He prepares, come on, he prepares a place at the table. There's favor on you. Watch what the Lord's going to do in this situation. Watch what God can do through adversity. All things do work together for good. And then another verse says, and all of God's promises for us in Christ Jesus, they are yes and amen. And we have to throw that in Christ Jesus. All of God's promises for you and for me in Jesus, they're yes, yes and amen. Apart from Jesus, we don't want that. But in Jesus, they're yes and amen. That's favor right there. Favor. He prepares a place for us. 
And then it takes us to this scripture right here. And this is where all of a sudden it's like, man, this message is going good, God. And then all of a sudden this thought came to me. I go, uh, oh, man, how does that work then? Because I'm reminded of these two scriptures. 1 Samuel 2.26. Meanwhile, this is the boy Samuel. He grew taller and grew in favor with the Lord and with people. This is the little boy Samuel. His mama couldn't have babies. She said, God, if you, if you bless me with a child, I will dedicate to him. I will give him back to you. God honors that prayer. And then Samuel grows up in the temple of the Lord. Remember that? As a young lad, all of a sudden he hears the voice of God, Samuel, Samuel. He thinks it's the old pastor or the priest calling his name in the middle of the night, needing some cool water or Gatorade, you know, and it's, it's not. It's God speaking to him. This is in a time when very few people, if any, heard the voice of God. Samuel was here, and he was a, he was a special kid. There was favor upon his life. It says that he grew in stature. That means physically, puberty, everything. He grew in stature and in favor with man and with God. How do you grow in favor? If you can't, if you can't find favor and, find, and, and, excuse me, and favor finds you, how do we grow in it? How does that work? And then in the New Testament, there's a parallel passage because Samuel grew in, in favor, in stature and in favor with God and man. But then in Luke 2, 52, it says, And Jesus grew in stature and in wisdom and in favor with God and all of the people. Samuel and Jesus, both of them. They grew up and they grew in favor. How does Jesus, who is not only the Son of God, but He is God, how does He grow in favor? Is that possible? How can that be? And I'm just going back and forth, and I remember studying this before. I'm like, God, remind me, how does this work? How can we grow in favor? And I was reminded, Jesus was 100% God. He's also 100% man. In His humanity, He still had to grow. In His humanity, he didn't have to empty himself out of sin, but he still had to mature. Oh, come on. Jesus was, was a perfect young boy, but he was still developing, and he grew in stature and in favor. As a matter of fact, for those of you who like to study these things out, Samuel, one of the great characters of the Old Testament, linked up with the other major characters of the Old Testament, he's the only one that has no sin ascribed to him. It doesn't say that he didn't sin, but he's the only leader of great significance that doesn't demonstrate any flaw as far as sin. Abraham sinned, Moses sinned, David sinned, all these other guys. But here's Samuel, a young man with the favor of God upon his life who grew in stature and in favor, and then Jesus grew the same way. We can grow in our favor. How does that work? So I'm going to try to answer that question to the best of my ability right here. How do we grow in our favor? Here's the key. And the Holy Spirit spoke this one to me. He says, John 3.30, John the Baptist is talking here. He says, Speak, this is John the Baptist speaking of his cousin Jesus. He says, he must become greater and greater, and I must become less and less. You want to grow in favor? This is how it works. Get out of the way. <laughs> you want the favor of God to increase in your life? Do we want to grow in the favor of the Lord? Get out of the way. Give him something to work with. He's already filled the reservoir, but there's too much of us oftentimes. And we're saying, God... Increase your favor upon my life. He says, I already sent it to you. Just get out of the way now. Oh, I'm preaching now. I'm preaching now. He must become greater. We must become less. Give, them more, give him more to work with. The more we make room for him on the inside, the more we decrease, the more the flesh takes a back seat, the more he can do through us. You want the favor of God to increase in your life? You just have to make room. You can tweet this next statement that I'm about to say. I don't know if I've heard this one. It could be original with me. It might have been the Holy Spirit. I'm not sure. But I, I, I promise you, I don't remember reading this anywhere. It's a great little statement right here. The less of you that's in the way, the more of him that's in display. Oh, come on. The less of you that's in the way, the more of him that's in display. Get out of the way. Oh, man. Philippians, it says, I think it's chapter 2, if I remember correctly, somewhere there. It says, for it's God that works within us to will and to act according to his good pleasure. He's the one that's working within us. But when we, it's like a glove, man. It's like God inserts his hand, and we're like just a glove. If we allow him to do his will and his purposes, he can fulfill his plans in and through our lives. That's the favor of God working through us. But if we plug up the fingers or whatever, and we don't give him room to go in and work within us, we're limiting his ability to accomplish his purposes. Make room. Get out of the way. <laughs> the keys to that, two things. Number one, you pray. Number two, obey. Pray and obey. Pray. Say, God, what is it that you want to do in my life? And then as he speaks, as the, as the irresistible friend speaks to us, obey. 
As we wrap up this time, I'm going to invite you to stand to your feet. We're speaking of the favor of God, and I thank you for your patience here as we're wrapping this time up. I'm kind of rush through some of these points here, but I'm hoping that the Holy Spirit can massage whatever you needed to hear tonight. We are great candidates of the favor of God. God wants us to be the head and not the tail, above and not beneath. It's not for our fame. It's not for our recognition, as Pastor Keys was saying. It's not because we're trying to become famous. No, we want him to become famous through us. We're just vessels. We want the favor of God. We need the favor of God. A while ago, one of my cars, I had to go into the dealer, and I'm, I'm talking. I brought my two daughters with me, and I sat there, and they were convinced, we're going to get this car, we're going to get this car, and we're going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Finally, I didn't get the car after two and a half hours. My daughters were mad. What? After two and a half hours here, we didn't get the car, and they're like stomping out, and we're just walking. And I felt at that moment right there, not a bit frustrated. I felt like I was Superman. I didn't cave in. I didn't give in to the pressures. For a mere $5, I didn't sign that contract. They missed out on a great contract with me. <laughs> but I sensed the favor of God. So you know what? I didn't fall for this. That's because God's got something better for me. My mechanic, I called him up. He had a great used car. I said, that's the car I need for the city right there. I can back up into other cars, hit their bumper, and it's all right. <laughs> it's all right. That's favor. <laughs> I'll take Hob home any day. Watch out, car behind us. Inside story, you can ask the brother about that. Favor. Wherever you're at, the favor of God. We need the favor of God. We can't do it out of our own strength, our own abilities. We need the supernatural input from the Holy Spirit. It's favor. But he wants to do that through us. Why not you? Someone's got to get the promotion. Someone's got to get that great house to move into. Someone's got to get that job. Why not you? Step out. Obey. Listen to what the Holy Spirit is speaking and obey the favor of God. Anybody want to receive some more favor? Come on. Only three hands went up. Anybody else want to grow in their favor tonight? Amen. Favor finds us. Let me pray a blessing over us tonight. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Lord, we thank you again. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your goodness. Holy Spirit, we thank you that you're the irresistible friend. You've called us to be irresistible people with an irresistible message. Lord, we need you. We're completely dependent upon you. We need your favor working in and through our lives. Father, you see every hand. More importantly, you see every heart and every circumstance, every situation that is going on and playing out in our lives. Lord, I pray for the favor of God to come and to rest upon each one, that we would grow in the favor of God, that we would grow to the point that you've called us to. God, open the doors for us. Make room for us. Make a way for those who've been just, just, just fighting it, Father God. Cause them, Lord God, to, to, to leap over these boundaries that would be limiting the purposes of God. Let the favor of God bring a shield of protection in the name of Jesus. And we declare that, that no weapon formed against us will prosper. All those that rise up against us, they will fall in the name of Jesus. Arise, God. Let your enemies be scattered. Father, let your goodness fall upon each one. Overshadow each one of us with your grace. Lord, we thank you for your favor. We thank you for your goodness. Father, thank you for an encouraging word even tonight. Thank you, God, that you are for us and not against us, and you promised that you would make a way for us. We give you praise. We give you thanks in the mighty name of Jesus. And everyone who agreed said amen and amen. Hey, we love you guys. Thanks for hanging out at City Life Church. If you need prayer about any one thing, we'd love to pray with you guys. we got some prayer uh, folks that will come and they'll just be standing out here. We'd love to pray for you if you have a prayer request. For the rest of us, have a great week. Friday night, if you're available from 7 to 8, we're going to hang out right here. God bless you guys. Have a great week. Amen.